This week on The Anxious Truth, the podcast about anxiety, anxiety disorders, and anxiety recovery, we're going to be talking about expectations and how they matter. If you're struggling with anxiety all the time, but insisting on expecting to be calm, it's going to be a rough ride. So let's get into that right now. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is episode 303 of the podcast. We are recording in October of 2024, and I am Drew Linsalata, creator and host of The Anxious Truth. I am, as of October 2024, a therapist practicing under supervision with a specialty in anxiety and anxiety disorders. I'm a three-time author on the topic of anxiety disorders and anxiety recovery, a former sufferer, unfortunately, of panic disorder, agoraphobia, OCD, and depression, for many years of my life on and off, but doing much better now. Thank you. And an educator and an advocate in the anxiety disorder community. If this is your first time here at The Anxious Truth, I do hope that you find today's episode helpful. And I encourage you to check out all the other free podcast episodes and videos I've recorded over the last 10 years. Of course, if you are a returning listener or viewer, welcome back. And thank you for supporting my work by being here and really allowing me to take up some of your valuable time. Because I do know that it's valuable and I appreciate you. So today we're going to talk about expectations. Mainly, we're going to talk about how always expecting or probably more accurately hoping or demanding that you will have a calm body and mind. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be calm and having nice days, of course. But if your reality is that you're struggling with anxiety most of the time, then expecting to be calm and with a quiet mind is going to make things harder than they already are. What I really want to do today is kind of shine a light on how what we expect really does have a major influence on what we experience and how we feel. It's probably more accurate to say that what we insist we must have has a major impact on our experiences and how we feel. But we'll get to that in a minute. First, just a quick reminder, as always, that beyond just this podcast episode or this YouTube video, there are a ton of other resources focused on anxiety disorders and anxiety recovery on my website, which is at theanxioustruth.com. I've written books on this topic. I have a range of low-cost psychoeducational workshops available that focus on anxiety disorders and, say, chronic anxiety and recovery. And there are all the other free videos and podcasts and social media content that I've created over the years. All the links. All of those goodies can be found on my website, which is again at theanxioustruth.com. So take a few minutes and certainly check that out. Avail yourself of all the things. Of course, if you have questions about what you hear today, you can follow the link in the podcast description, which is in your podcast app, however way you're listening, to send me a message via text. And don't worry, I don't ever see your number and I cannot text you back. So there's no spam or garbage involved there. And of course, if you're watching on YouTube, Feel free to leave a comment, and I promise I will do my best to circle back here as soon as possible and answer as many questions and comments as I possibly can. So let's get into the meat of it, expectations. I want to start by looking at a practical example. So my vision is terrible. It always has been since I was a kid. I wear multifocal contact lenses like I'm wearing today or progressive lens eyeglasses. I even have a pair of glasses with lenses designed specifically for working at my desk on the computer. Like that's how bad my eyes are. They really stink. Now, after wearing those glasses, sort of the desk glasses for a few hours, I get up from my desk and switch to my other glasses that have the progressive lenses. Now, if you wear glasses or contacts, you probably know what's coming, right? There's that period of adjustment where my eyes and brain have to get used to the other lenses because they have different zones to look through and things just look differently. When I get up from my desk in that instance, things just don't look quite right. I'm actually looking through the bottom of, of my progressive lenses because I tend to keep my chin up by default and I've forgotten that I switched glasses. Now this makes everything blurry in the distance because I'm reading, looking through the reading part of the lenses. I can't really focus properly in that situation and that leads to feeling slightly off balance. And that all happens like boom, within like a millisecond or two, right? It's pretty quick. Now, in that situation, the expectation of my brain was clear focus and a steady feeling in my body, but I didn't get that. I got something that did not match that prediction. In that moment, I really did feel a jolt of discomfort or anxiety. We maybe even can call it fear. There was a quick like, you know, what's that? Because it wasn't what I was expecting. Don't know what it was exactly, but it happened. And this is where things get interesting and tie into today's topic. 
If this was early 2008, when I was really struggling, the mismatch between what my brain expected and what it got would have totally triggered like the anxiety and panic spiral. I would have experienced that first jolt of fear or discomfort. And for more on that, you could check out episode 83 of the Disordered podcast that I do with Josh Fletcher for a good explanation of first and second fear. I will link that in the description. And that mismatch would have triggered that spiral. Then I would have started fighting against my experience. I would have instantly try, started trying harder to sort of focus and checking rapidly up and down to see if my eyes were working. I would have tried to force clarity visually. I would have probably grabbed onto my desk and declared myself about to tip over. And in general, I would have started treating myself like I was fragile and about to break in some unknown way. I don't really know what that way ever was, but that's what I would have done. And you guys may be able to relate to that, depending on where you are in your anxiety journey. But here's the important part. When I would do that, like when I would behave like I was in danger, because my brain misinterpreted the expectation mismatch as actual danger, I would have created more secondary fear, right? Dr. Weeks, Dr. Claire Weeks talked about first fear, second fear. And again, we talked about that on episode 83 of Disordered. What does that fear do? What does any fear do? It's going to create natural physical responses in the body, and it's going to kick the brain into problem solving and self preservation mode, which is generally indicated by lots of scary racing thoughts about what disaster might have awaited me in the next few minutes or hours or I don't even know when but again, if you're an anxious person listening to this podcast or watching this video, you know what I'm talking about. Now for an anxious person stuck on expecting or really demanding a calm state, even when none is to be found. This is a real problem because the initial mismatch between my reality and my expectation or demands triggers a sequence that creates an even bigger mismatch between what I expect or demand and what I get. So can you see the problem here? Like this actually creates a problem. The mismatch between expectation and reality makes an anxious person react in ways that create a larger and more prolonged mismatch which fuels even more avoidance and resistance, which creates more of a mismatch that lasts longer and the cycle continues. When you look at it this way, it's really ugly and it looks kind of evil, doesn't it? But this is what we experience. So what are we supposed to do with this? Well, if we return to expectations or demands, the clue is to be found there. If you are struggling with an anxiety disorder or chronic anxiety that you fear, hate, and you're trying to desperately control it, fix it or avoid it to no avail, nothing is working to do that, then how is it helping you to expect or ac more accurately demand a calm body and mind as if something magic is going to happen right now to just make that all go away, which would be nice, but that doesn't seem to be available to us. Well, spoiler alert, it doesn't help you. That demand and expectation does not help you. It describes the situation I'm you know, bringing about here. The demand for it to go away is met with the reality that it hasn't gone away and things quickly get lit on fire and turn into a raging inferno of fear and anxiety and panic and racing thoughts and scary things and discomfort and resistance that fuels more fire and more discomfort. So what can you really do with that? Does this mean that you're doomed to just have to expect to suffer with anxiety every day for the rest of your life? Do you have to wake up every single day and just expect every day to really suck? No, that's not at all what I'm saying here. It might sound like that, but I promise that's not what I'm saying. But I think what we have to recognize is that wanting to feel calm is fine. It's okay to want to feel that. Hell, I support that. But demanding calm that is clearly out of reach at the moment, and that's the important part at the moment, is counterproductive, even though it seems like it makes common sense to demand that. So if we work on expecting to be anxious, we work on expecting to have anxiety symptoms, and we expect to experience scary or troubling thoughts, because those things are here, like it or not, we give ourselves more of a fighting chance to kind of stop the resistance and achieve an acceptance or surrender posture when needed. We can allow those scary and difficult experiences to sort of ebb and flow naturally, like all internal experiences do, if we let them. Now, if you've been listening to this podcast or watching this YouTube channel long enough, or maybe reading my books, you already know that it's that experience 
it changes on its own without me forcing it or managing it or saving me myself from it is the key experience that turns down the volume on the disordered anxiety. And yes, I'm going to say this, it gives your nervous system a chance to sort of naturally regulate itself over time, because it knows how to do that without being forced or coerced into regulating on demand with tricks or hacks that tend not to work or only work temporarily. Now you might be asking yourself, is there science behind this? Or are you just making it up because you think it sounds good? Well, to be honest with you, that's a question people ask me sometimes about this podcast or this YouTube channel. There's always science behind this. This isn't a science channel. So I'm not going to bury you in like, you know, references and research references, but there is science behind this. If you dig into predictive processing models of experience, which is pretty big deal in neuroscience and cognitive science right now, these predictive processing models ex uh, of experience kind of describe the creation of a subjective experience, which is what we all have. It's all of our experiences are subjective in some way as sort of the math that gets done when brains have to resolve their predictions and expectations with the data streams they get from the senses. And that's a little bit oversimplified, but that's it in a nutshell. In a non-anxious context, if I get up from my desk, I expect my eyes to focus and I expect to feel steady on my feet. When I don't, my brain sees a mismatch between what it expected, its predictive model, and what it got. And then it has to take things into account and adjust the predictive model to accommodate the fact that I just changed glasses and need a minute or two to adjust. I'm not still not focusing right and still not perfectly rock solid. But the initial jolt of discomfort dissipates quickly because there's no second fear. Because my brain in that situation was open minded. Can a brain be open minded? Sure, my brain was open minded. And it adjusted its expectation, it adjusted its predictive model to more closely match the data that it got. Oh, yeah, we just got up from the desk. Oh, yeah, we just changed glasses. I kind of expect things to be kind of wonky for a minute or two. Things work out better that way. And that's one of the things that accounts for the decrease in secondary fear and it accounts for the, the shortening of that distance between OMG, which I had for a second and oh, well, which I also had and a recovered state. We've talked about this before on the podcast and here on the YouTube channel. Recovery is really defined by the shortening of that time frame, right? Everybody gets those OMG moments, but how fast can you recognize what's going on, go into an acceptance or, or surrender posture and get to OL and move on. In a state of disordered anxiety, we hold on so tightly to, de to the demand to feel a certain way that we pay extremely close, abnormally close attention to our subjective internal experiences. And we simply cannot zoom out to take other factors into account. So 2008 Drew, when I was in the thick of it, would have ignored the glasses situation completely. His brain was unable to be open minded and flexible. It only knew that it needed calm and steady feelings. So it would hang on to that like hot death, it would cling to the original expectation or predictive model. And I would fight like crazy to try to make that model be my truth in air quotes. And predictive processing models in neuroscience and cognitive science even have a phrase for this sort of warping of the experience. It's called precision waiting, which is really just a fancy term for attention. Anxious 2008 Drew was so focused on one set of variables in that complicated equation that his brain placed a huge value on those which skewed the math and made it almost impossible to adjust expectations and the predictive model to support a more flexible acceptance or surrender posture. Now, remember, as with everything that I talk about here on this podcast and this YouTube channel, these are not switches that you could just decide to flip. If you're hearing this and you think, well, this sounds pretty cool, I can use this, that's awesome. But you can't hear this, like it, and then instantly be in a state of full acceptance that you will be anxious and uncomfortable for the rest of the day. Cool, I'm just gonna accept that I'll be anxious and everything's gonna be better. I wish it worked that way, but it never works that way. However, if you can start to bring your awareness to the fact that you are turning hope, hope that you feel better into a demand to feel better instantly without even realizing it, it can help you see when you start thrashing and fighting against your reality, which another paradox makes it even harder to get the reality that you so desperately want. Now, 
everything I'm saying here includes a ton of stuff that I've covered in other episodes and in my books and many years of social media posts. So if you're new to this kind of thing, and lately, especially on YouTube, there's a lot of new people, welcome. And you are wondering how this fits into learning how to calm down, stop your scary thoughts, prevent panic, or just make it all stop by working directly on trying to feel better. You're going to want to go back and start listening from the beginning, or maybe go over to disorder.fm and listen to the first 10 or so episodes of that podcast at Disordered, or maybe even grab a copy of my book, The Anxious Truth, which explains this all in greater detail. Again, if you're new, you might still be thinking, oh, this is an anxiety channel, he teaches me how to calm down. He doesn't, he teach you how to get he teaches you how to get better at being anxious and afraid. And the happy secondary effect of that over time is that you tend to calm down. But if you already understand the concepts, and you're working to implement them in your own work, maybe you're working alongside, you know, the work that you're doing with a therapist or a counselor, becoming more aware of how expectations and demands play a role in what your anxiety experience looks and feels like can be one of those missing puzzle pieces that might help you make the actual change that you've been trying to make to start to learn these lessons so that you get that happy secondary effect down the road of overcoming this whole nasty affair. It's okay to want to feel better. I want you to feel better. It's not a crime to want to feel better. But wanting to feel better and insisting that that is the only outcome that you can accept at any given moment, even when your reality like mine did in the past clearly does not match that outcome can really make the process of recovery even harder than it has to be. Hope to feel better. I want you to feel better. But if the reality is that we are struggling with disordered and chronic anxiety on a daily basis right now, then just digging your feet in, like making fists, gritting your teeth and demanding that it be different than that leads to those rigid expectations that doesn't really help your brain recognize what's going on, adjust its predictive processing models, understand that this is supposed to happen and let you relax into it and surrender into it and you know, willfully tolerate through it, float, whatever words you want. We got to have that shift. And in Disordered, we called it, I forget what episode it was of Disordered, we actually called it the attitude shift. This is part of that. This is my reality. I am an anxious person today. I am working on it. But if I try so hard to demand that I not be an anxious person today, things are going to get much more difficult for me. So expectations do matter on the micro level and the macro level. Take that into account. But as always, when you're doing this stuff, you have to give it a chance because you have to be patient. These are not things that just change instantly because you want them to. You're learning new ways to do things. You're learning new behavioral patterns. You're writing new neural pathways. You're trying to build default reactions and actions that take preference over some longstanding old safety-based responses. It takes a while. Be nice to yourself. Be patient and just do the best you can. So that is it. That is episode, what is it? 303, The Anxious Truth in the books. You know it's over because the music is playing. Of course, I'm going to ask you the same things that I ask at the end of every podcast episode, which is if you are listening to this on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, maybe take a minute and rate the podcast five stars if you dig it. If you really like it, maybe write a review to tell people why you dig it so much because it helps other people find the podcast and it helps more people get the help that they want, which is why I do this to begin with. Of course, if you're watching on YouTube, maybe hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell so you know when I upload new, st new stuff, leave a comment, ask questions. And of course, head on over to theanxioustruth.com and check out all my other resources. I think they're helpful. People seem to think they are, which I'm pretty proud of. So check them out. And uh, that's it. I will be back in two weeks with episode 304 of the podcast. I'm not necessarily sure what we're going to talk about, but I will be here. And remember, no matter how small the step is today, away from your fear and toward the life you actually want, it counts. They all add up. They will matter. Be patient. Be kind. Do the best you can every day. A tiny little change every day will make a difference. I'll see you next time. We are out.